The following is an audio adaptation of Jeremy Bove's The Protagonist Theory, a video essay, narrated for you by the author. You can find an AI narrated version on the YouTube channel if you want. I don't see why you'd want that, but I did it anyway. Please note that this contains references to sex, violence, and basically everything else you'd expect for a kid complaining about world problems. Thank you, and settle in. The Protagonist Theory A slightly unhinged feminist in heavy quotation marks essay by Jeremy Bove. Warning, this crap is cr gets crazy. And I don't fully list my entire opinion in this, so don't assume that everything you, in hear, you hear in this is gospel to what I believe. Because it, it actually could tell a message that I'm not trying to tell now that I think about it. So, I'm going to be making more videos similar to this that'll better explain this. Before I go any further, I must state formally that I am, in fact, a white heterosexual male native to the Northeastern United States. I am not and have not ever been anything but a male, and most likely will stay that way. I have lived a relatively good life and don't have much to complain about. With that said, here we go. The protagonist theory. I am a writer, a prolific one at that. I write fantasy, magical realism, some forms of sci-fi, and several other genres. It was only last year that I realized, after looking back at the writing I had done in the past few months, that I was, to my own dismay, a feminist. And I realized also that I, might have, that I might have been one the entire time. I must stress to the highest degree that I did not choose to be a feminist. It chose me. And it won't let me leave. In the end, being a feminist is a condition, not a philosophy. You experience literal symptoms that worsen the more and more you realize that's the case. You have a harder and harder time enjoying a lot of things, namely media created before the 1980s. But, in the end, I don't mind it. So, back to the writer thing. One of the things that I've always thought about is what it means to be a protagonist. Now, here's what I believe. This isn't exactly the exact dictionary definition of protagonist, but it's still technically true. The protagonist is the main character of the story. They are always, or almost always, in the spotlight. The protagonist is not always the hero. Sometimes the protagonist and the antagonist are one and the same. We call that an anti-hero. The protagonist is with you all the way most of the time. There are three main types of stories, these being first person, second person, and third person. For our purposes, we will not be discussing the second person perspective. In a first person story, things are always from the protagonist's perspective, although, depending on the tense and format of the story, the reader can be allowed to know things that the protagonist doesn't yet know, especially if it's a past tense story. Some stories don't have protagonists, but most do. Some stories have multiple protagonists, an example being a piece of my childhood, the cartoon Wild Kratz, which centers around the two brothers, Martin and Chris. One thing that is almost entirely consistent is that, if the story is not from the protagonist's perspective, it will be within their horizons. A story follows the protagonist, like a kid following their parent through a crowded marketplace. Sometimes the kid will go look at something and turn around to find the parent gone. But they will eventually find themselves back behind the parent, sometimes holding their hand, sometimes lagging behind. If I stand in a field in the sunset, I can see what is directly in front of me, and the horizon. This doesn't mean I can see what's in, what's in between me and the horizon, among the dark trees. The story focuses on everything between the protagonist and the horizon, even if the protagonist can't quite see it. The story tells about things that still concern the protagonist, not always what the protagonist knows. The protagonist is arguably the most important character in the story. There is no character in the story who is 100% safe from being killed off, but if anyone is most likely to survive, it's the protagonist. And if the protagonist does die, they're probably going to be the last major character to do so. This brings me to the topic of a deuteragonist. The deuteragonist is the second most important character in the story, such as the protagonist's best friend, sister, brother, or close cousin. In some stories, all three will survive. The protagonist and the, and the deuteragonist confront the antagonist, and eventually come to a, an agreement in which the antagonist promises to change their ways for the better. Sometimes, nobody survives. The protagonist, deuteragonist, and antagonist are trapped in a building with a bomb set by the antagonist. The protagonist successfully kills the antagonist, but they and the deuteragonist are unable to escape the building before the bomb goes off. The most real thing you, to you in the world is yourself. It's the closest to you. 
If there's anything in the story that's closest to the reader's self, it's the protagonist, as, the, as if they are an avatar for the reader in the story's world. If worlds were to collide and the reader were to, be, were to become one with a single person or thing in the story's, story's world, it would be the protagonist by default. If you were to reach your finger past the page and into the story's world, it's likely that the first thing you would touch would be the protagonist's shoulder. The protagonist, no matter how much influence they have on the plot, is the center of the story. They are, by a more metaphorical interpretation, the reason the story can take form at all, the win window from our world into the story. A protagonist could be responsible for moving the entire plot along, the true most important character in the story, or they could be not much more than the camera person, showing what's happening but having little more effect than the sound of their footsteps present in the grass. Now, what does this have to do with feminism, or anything of the sort? Well, we're focusing on one specific story. This story is ongoing, and is still being written. It's the story of humanity. Before I say anything else, I am aware that there are technically more than two sexes, and more than two genders. There is a whole spectrum of these things that have been discovered or introduced for, throughout the years. But for this purpose, we will be limited to bio two biologically standard sexes, male and female. Also, this is, this is an incredibly, like, you know, controversial topic, so I don't want to get into it that much anyway. Secondly, I am aware that there are more than three roles in the story. There are many. But once again, we will mostly be limiting it, limiting it to three. With all these uncertainties, we must set some ground rules. Although it is impossible to say exactly when humanity, Homo sapiens sapiens specifically, came into existence, we can assume it was about 200,000 years ago. Unless this document is lying in the rubble on a post-apocalyptic world, we can assume that humanity hasn't gone extinct yet. Whether we all die tomorrow night, or we survive until the very moment the universe explodes into a fiery nova, we're going to be extinct someday. Rule number one. The story of humanity begins around the time that humanity, Homo sapiens sapiens, came into existence. And it ends when humanity goes extinct. Thus, it is still being written, and we have no way of knowing where the plot will go next. Here, here are the other rules. The story of humanity has three roles for its characters. Protagonist, Deuteragonist, and Antagonist. The story only has two characters. Both of these characters can, will, could, and or have played the role of the Antagonist. Only one character can be the Protagonist, and only one can be the Deuteragonist. There can be only one Protagonist. These two characters are woman and man. The real question we're trying to answer, with all the meaning of the word protagonist in mind, is which character is the deuteragonist and which character is the protagonist. There is only one answer. Now, let's figure it out. First, we should look at the character of man. In the story so far, it would appear that almost every prominent achievement between the two characters has been achieved by man. Man was the first to fly beyond the speed of sound. Man has won all the great wars fought and fought all the most valiant battles. Man was the first to touch the stars, and the first to see the bottom of the ocean. Man has toppled all the evil world leaders and criminals. Man invented all the world's most powerful weapons. The sword, the rifle, the crossbow, and the nuclear bomb. Man built most of the world's buildings, brick by brick. Man wrote all the great world's greatest stories. Most of the world's greatest and strongest leaders have been men. Men have, have made all the biggest decisions. Man has always been the one to make history. This must mean that, without a doubt, man must be the protagonist, right? No, not at all, actually. In fact, there's some evidence to be found that some of the claims might be entirely false. There's a chance that man just wrote its own truth first, first in some cases. That's just what man wants you to think. All this really confirms is that man wants to be the protagonist most. Not only that, but man has also made every measure to make woman look not just unfit, but useless. Look at all the world's supposed greatest stories. The Greek myths, the Egyptian legends, the medieval stories of old. All of them have male protagonists. In the stories of old, we have Odysseus, Achilles, King Arthur, Macbeth, Hercules, Robin Hood, and the countless knights in shining armor. We have the movies and comic books of the 20th century, Rambo, Indiana Jones, James Bond, Superman, Iron Man, The Hulk, Luke Skywalker. And finally, the video games of the 1990s and the 21st century, Duke Nukem, Master Chief, Link, The Doom Slayer. All of them have been men. But not just that, they're all big, muscular men. Military leaders, kings, thanes, soldiers, and mercenaries. And in all of these narratives, women are depicted as helpless damsels in distress, princesses and maidens and whatnot who just scream and cry and whine. 
And worse yet, if you do come across a female protagonist, it's probably going to be in an adult narrative. Almost all stories for preteens and young adults have male protagonists, not even giving kids a chance to accept the idea of a female hero. And furthermore, most of the ones that do have female protagonists are usually intended specifically for girls, thus greatering the sex divide. Man hasn't just stated how good it is, it has also literally walked right up to the author and told them, specific explicitly, that it should be. Man has proclaimed itself to be the perfect protagonist. But what I'm about to do is dissect Man's claim. We'll see how it holds up to one simple attack. Once I'm done, we'll see who's the real damsel in distress. Man wants the author to believe that woman not only didn't and won't do great things, but it can't do great things, that it's somehow too small, weak, frail, or stupid. Before I say anything else, I must say that I simply hate the Greek myths in their entirety. They're boring, poorly written, and just about big strong men and going on dumb adventures, stabbing monsters, making out with witches, and whenever they actually don't know what to do, one of the gods throws a magic lightning bolt to fix everything. And the protagonists often just kill random people for no reason whatsoever. Greek myths are so old-fashioned that they make the first season of Star Trek look like it's woke as a pride parade. Now, let's say we have a big, strong, muscly military man. He wakes up in the morning, has a lavish breakfast, says hello to his son, and goes to the range, flexes his muscles, and shoots some targets with his big, muscly machine gun. He is skilled and perfectly accurate, always hitting bullseyes. The military man then goes to the battlefield, dodging shells and shooting people left and right, being brave and sweating his butt off. He gets slightly wounded, goes back to the tent to get treatment, and returns to battle. After a great victory against the enemy, the military man goes back to the capital to have a party in his newly tailored suit, before going home to have dinner, a shower, and then going to bed. Now, if you look at, about, look at think about it on the surface, the military man seems to be strong, self-sufficient, and skilled. He doesn't need help from anyone. If he did get help, he wouldn't be as manly. But then you start to wonder, who made the military man breakfast? Who takes care of his son? Who irons his clothing? Who cleaned out his gun? Who treats his wounds? Who tailored his suit? Who cleaned the floor of the Capitol, Capitol building where the party was held? Who cooked his dinner? Who did the dishes afterward? Who made his bed? Who cleaned his sheets? And most important of all, who brought him into the world in the first place and tirelessly worked to feed him and raise him to be as strong as he is? Who does and has done all of these things for every strong military man in the world? That's right, a woman. If it weren't for women, none of these things would be possible. Women are the reason that the human race exists at all, in the most little literal sense possible. Technically, women invented men. And what did that military man really accomplish anyway? I know several people personally who disagree with me on this, but in the end, you can't deny that war is pointless. Speaking of Star Trek, you could have less empathy than Mr. Spock's dad, and you still would probably be able to figure out the objective mathematical, mathematical fact that war as a concept and as a practice is ridiculous. It's a waste of human life, resources, time, and energy. Even if you don't have a shred of emotional capacity, you can agree that war functionally makes no sense. I'm aware that these, there are female soldiers nowadays, and I'm not exactly against that, but that's a different discussion, and that it is possible for a female leader to start a war, but let's be honest. There's likely been over 5,000 wars in human history. And how many were started by women? About 10 or 15. And furthermore, even though there are female criminals, female murderers, female kidnappers, female terrorists, female mass shooters, and even female rapists, the majority of lawbreakers and bad guys are, statistically speaking, men. Women are not smarter than men. They never were. They're just less dumb. Men are simple creatures. They listen to their stomach and their you-know-what, and nothing else. Maurice Minifield from Northern Exposure said it himself. Woman, as a character, is always the underdog. And the best protagonists are underdogs. Woman has always worked against the odds, and every single turn the story's plot is thrown at it. While a man beat itself up and called it honor, a woman worked in the background getting the real work done. Woman was almost, emphasis on the almost, always the righteous one. It knew when to start, and it knew when to stop. Whenever man fell, a woman helped it up. Now, there are select cases and select chapters of the story where woman became the antagonist. This is very true, but the point still stands. Woman worked against odds that it could not control and persevered. And eventually, only in the last few chapters did woman get its catharsis moment, rising up and finally fighting for what it wanted. And man gave it nothing in return. In the end, all man did was create pointless new challenges for woman to either endure or overcome. And most of the time, woman was still up to the challenge. I'm very just sorry to say this to myself and my fellow males. We were never the main character. We were never the center of the story. No matter how much we tried, it's only now that we find that the author had the truth planned all along. 
We were just the sorry deuteragonists. The sidekicks. Always just to the side of the center. Important, but not the most important. A main character, but not the main character. Women are the real protagonists. They always were, and they always will be. But that's not even the worst part. Women still need men, right? There needs to be a male and a female to produce offspring. And in the short term, yes, this is true. Without men, humanity would go extinct. But in the long term, it's not that simple. There's a species of reptile in the deserts of Arizona known as the Desert Grassland Whiptail Lizard. Espodocellus uniparens. They aren't very remarkable at first glance. Each whiptail lizard is about 16, 6 inches long, striped, and has long, thin fingers. They are fast insect eaters which are mostly mind their own business. They seem like just like a generic lizard, except one thing sets them apart. Every single desert grassland whiptail lizard is a female. There's not a single man among them. These creatures are capable of producing eggs all on their own without the need for a mate. This is known as parthenogenesis, common among some species of reptiles. And the scariest part is, there probably were, at one point, males of the species. But then, once parthenogenesis came into play as a mutation, there was no need for males. They all died off, and soon, there were none left. Humans are animals. It is biologically impossible for an animal species to survive only with male individuals. But, as the whiptail lizard has proved, it is, evolution it is evolutionarily possible for a species to survive with only females. It is extremely unlikely, especially for mammals like us, but it is possible. We might be screwed. There could come a time when we're no longer needed. And we can already read the writing on the wall. With all the war, rape, harassment, and general idiocy we men frankly love to cause, we're asking for it. Now it's time that we reveal the author. Mother Nature is the author of our story, and she knows full well that between the two characters, she'd rather kill off man. Mother Nature could make Parthenogenesis a plot device. Mother Nature knows how it feels to be a mother, so she knows where, the he where heroism really lies. Just like any story, movie, video game, or play, the story of humanity is made in scenes. And there's nothing stopping Mother Nature from, given a few thousand more years of writing, to create a scene like the following. The two characters are walking along the edge of a cliff. Man looks to the side, temporarily distracted. Woman takes the opportunity and shoves man off the cliff. Man clings to the edge and begs woman to pull it back up. A wicked smile crosses woman's face. And then a woman undoes man's grip, causing it to fall to its death, uttering the words, Long live the queen. Well, well, boys, I guess we're not sleeping tonight. Um, thank you for listening to that insane rambling from the darkest depths of my brain. Um, and I hope you enjoy my next video essay, which I have not actually written yet, admittedly, which is the Beckett theory, which is about video games. It's not really feminist, it's more just like equity, period. Um, but it has, like, feminist elements, also environmentalist elements, um, and obviously this segment right here, um, is not scripted, I'm just talking from my head, but once again, thank you for listening, and that will be all.